We saw in our Sunday school lesson last week that God, he will certainly call on God. He will certainly use those who are of a younger generation. So that means that we shouldn't ignore those who are younger than us. We should not ignore the youth, should we? That is again, something that we'll see here in our Sunday school lesson this week. Where our lesson this week, it takes place there in the fifth chapter of 2 Kings. We're told there in the opening verse of that chapter that the commander of the army of Syria, a man who was named Naaman, we are told that he was a great, that he was an honorable man in the eyes of his master, his master being the king. Now, just because this king saw him as an honorable man, a man of valor, that does not mean that this man was truly a man of honor, a man of valor in the eyes of the Lord. The reason why he was regarded as being so highly honorable in the king's eyes, we're told there in the first verse, was because he had led Syria to victory over Israel. Now the victory over Israel here was again, part of God's judgment of Israel. Israel being the, the Northern Kingdom. By this time, uh, all of Israel had been divided. It had been separated into two kingdoms with Israel being in the North with Judah being in, in the South. The Northern Kingdom of Israel, it had long forsook the Lord by this point in scripture. By this point in time, Israel, they were under the leadership of Ahab, who was again married to Jezebel, and we know how wicked Ahab and Jezebel were. And so this was part of God's judgment against the Northern Kingdom, where again, the Assyrians, they went into the Northern Kingdom and they conquered the Northern Kingdom. And again, we are told that Naaman was the commander of the army that led to that led the defeat of Ahab and the conquering of the Northern Kingdom as well. Now. We'll see there again, looking at that first verse, that, that Naaman, as mighty of a man he was, as much of a man of honor and valor he was, he was a man that suffered from leprosy. He was a leper. Now, though there is treatment for leprosy today, back then in those times, being a leper was essentially like being cursed. We, we see in scripture where lepers, they were often excommunicated from their community. So that was something you did not want to come down with leprosy back then. So again, this man, he was a man who was honorable in his king's eyes. He was a mighty man, a, a man of valor. So someone like him, they should not come down with leprosy. However, this man did. Now, we'll see that, that something had to be done about this. As we take a look at the second verse there, we are told there that a young girl from the land of Israel had been brought back as a captive. She served Naaman's wife, we are told there in scripture. Now, I do, do believe that there was some distress about in Naaman's, about his leprosy. And I do believe that there was a, a desire for something to be done about it. And again, the reason why I say that is because we'll see there in the third verse that even the young girl knew about it. And, and we'll see that she even had a desire for, for this man to be helped. And we're told there in, in the third verse that this young girl has said, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would, the prophet would heal him of his leprosy. So it's again clear that this young girl that that she wants to help and and again who is it that this young girl believes can help not some other gods right she believes that the prophet of the lord she believes that the prophet of the lord could could help this man who again was actually holding her captive she believed again that the prophet of the lord therefore she believed in God, in the power of God. She believed in, in what God could do. Now, would the rest believe her? Would the rest, would the adults, would they listen to this young girl? That is the question. How many of us will listen to young children today? How many of us will listen to teenagers today? How many of us will listen to the youth today? Now we'll see there in the fourth verse that Naaman's wife, where she could have ignored this young girl, we'll see that she did not do that. We'll see there that she took word of what this young girl had said. She took it to her husband. She took it to Naaman, 
who then took the girl's words to the king. The king could have also had done the same, right? This king, he could have ignored Naaman. He could have ignored Naaman's wife, which again, those words, they, they track back to that young girl. So the king could have ignored the words of this young Israelite girl. I want to highlight as well there. Again, this was an Israelite girl who, again, they had just finished defeating. And so they could have ignored her. They did not do that. We'll see there in the fifth verse that they heeded this young girl's words because, again, the thought here was about helping Naaman, right? And so again, there in that fifth verse, we'll see that they heeded her words and that Naaman, he was sent to the land of Israel and he was sent to that land with a letter to give to the king along with gold, money. And when we skip down to the ninth verse there, we'll see that Naaman, that he arrived at the house of the prophet, that he stood in the door of the prophet, leaving his horse and his, his chariot behind. The prophet we'll see there in that verse was Elisha. That's E-L-I-S-H-A, not Elijah, but Elisha, the one who had picked up the mantle of Elijah. Now, by that point in time, Elisha, he was a well-known prophet, a prophet who had many works by that point in time. We would say many miracles by that point in time. He had healed many. He had even restored the life of the Shunammite woman's son by that point in time as well. So that was why the, the young girl had so much faith in, in what the prophet of God and what Elisha could do in being able to help Naaman here. That is why she was speaking so highly of him because she had even heard about, and maybe uh, again was a witness to seeing some of those who had been helped by, by the prophet. And so in the 10th verse, we'll see there that Naaman, as he stood there at the door of the prophet, we'll see that Elisha, that he sent a messenger to Naaman, who told Naaman to go and to wash in the Jordan seven times, that is the Jordan River. He was to go into Washington, Jordan for, for seven times, and if he would do that, he would be restored. So that was a very simple task. That Those were, were very in simple instructions for, for Naaman to do, right? It was too simple for Naaman. As we'll see there in the 11th verse, that, that Naaman, he, he became furious, and he, he went away grumbling at what Elisha had, or what Elisha had said to him. He was saying to himself, he will surely come out to me. That is the prophet, that is Elisha. He will surely come out to me and call on the name of the Lord, his God. Naaman said that Elisha, that he would wave his hand. He would wave his hand over the place and that he would heal him of his leprosy. So, so Naaman, he couldn't take Elisha's word, he couldn't take that and, and go with it. He could not run with, with Elisha's instructions, could he? No, again, he was looking for a show. He was looking for a performance, if you will. He needed to see, he needed to see Elisha. He needed to see him do some form of magic, if you will, in order for, for him to believe. There are many people today who, when they go to God, when they pray to the Lord for help, they need to see a show. They need to see a sign in the air. They need to see a sign in the sky. They need to have this feeling, this warm, fuzzy feeling. They needed to have, they needed to wash over them in order for them to believe that, that God heard their prayers and that, that the Lord is moving on their behalf. Is that how it works? Is that how you think that it works? You need to see a sign from God that, that a feeling needs to come over you in order for you to believe that the Lord heard your prayer? Is that how it works? That's not how it works. And so in the 12th verse, we'll see there in his thoughts that, that Naaman, he said, aren't the rivers of Damascus, aren't they better than all the waters of Israel? Seems that he was he had holding on to some type of disgust for, for his former enemy the Israelites. And so again, there in that verse, he, he wondered if he could just go and wash in, in, in those rivers, the rivers of Damascus and be healed. If all it took was washing in the Jordan seven times. Now his thoughts, they are the very thoughts that, that leads to actions that are of wickedness. They lead to actions that, that go unrewarded, right? 
and I said this a long time ago, and I, and I often repeat this, when God gives you instructions, which again, Naaman has actually received through the prophet of the Lord, you best heed his instructions. You best heed the Lord's instructions. You cannot disregard God's instructions. You cannot ignore God's instructions and believe that you are going to be rewarded with his blessings. That is not how it works. You, you have to be obedient to the Lord's instructions. You have to heed God's instructions if you desire to heed the or receive the rewards of the Lord. That is how, again, we are rewarded with God's blessings by being obedient, by heeding his instructions. Naaman, he, he has an opportunity here, which again, traces all the way back to the words of this young girl. And, and what we'll see here in the 13th verse is that, that his servants, they, they remind him of this. You have an opportunity here to be healed. You have an opportunity here to, to be blessed. And, and we'll see there in the 13th verse that Naaman's servants, that they say to him there, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Imagine here holding yourself back from God's blessings because the Lord didn't give you a sign in the sky because some warm, fuzzy feeling didn't wash over you. Imagine holding yourself back from God's blessing because nothing spectacular had happened. That was what Naaman, that is what Naaman was doing there. And that sounds crazy, right? When God tells us our blessing is over there and all we have to do is just go over there and, and take the blessing. All Naaman had to do was go and wash in the Jordan seven times. The blessing was right there. And this man was pushing away his blessing because the prophet didn't wave his hand all over the place. There are many people today who are holding themselves back from God's blessing because they can't follow simple instructions. They, they have to see a sign in the sky or this warm, fuzzy feeling have to wash over them. I feel a lot of folks that they need to hear from us who are of sincere faith today. They need to hear us say like the servants said to, to Naaman here. They need to simply hear us say to them, just follow God's instructions. Stop, stop ignoring God. Stop ignoring what he has told you to do. Stop trying to, to, to go off on your own thoughts. Stop trying to go off in your own way. The proverb has said to us that, that, that a fool believes that his way is right and, and that he will go in his way, but his way is one that will lead to destruction. So many people need to hear that today. God gives us instructions which are actually simple. They are simple for us to hear, but actually putting forth the effort in doing it takes us so much effort to just go and do the simple because we want the spectacular. Yes, God is a miracle worker. Yes, God will do the impossible for us, but we don't have to see a sign in the sky and this magical feeling, it does not have to, to wash over us. All we need to do is simply listen and do. Now, when we take a look there at the 14th verse, We'll see that Naaman, he heeded the words of the servants there, his servants there. He went and he did as the prophet had instructed. And scripture tells us there that Naaman's flesh was restored and it was made smooth like the flesh of a little child. We were told there that he was clean. And after he had done what was instructed by the prophet, we'll see there in the 15th verse that he returned to Elisha and that he was grateful and that he praised the Lord saying there, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except the God in Israel. Now think about this. I want you to think about this today. Naaman, he was healed, right? Naaman, he receives this blessing. And again, this healing, this blessing, it traces all the way back to the words of the young girl. Now imagine had, Nathan, had Naaman been too stubborn. Imagine had he chose to ignore his wife who had, again, relayed the words of the young girl to him. Imagine had the king been prideful and again, been stubborn to, to ignore Naaman, who again was speaking the words that the young girl had shared. He would not have been healed, would he? He would have not been restored, would he? 
Now think about where we are today as a church, where we are today as a society. And, and think about where we could be if we did not re disregard the words of, of others who, who we think that we stand over, who we think that we are higher than, who we think that we are superior to. That's something that our society suffers from, this, this superiority complex to where, again, we think that we know better. There are many people today who think that they know more than everyone, that they know what is best, that they know better. And the only thing that they end up doing is holding not somebody else back necessarily, they hold themselves back. And if they hold themselves back, they are willing to hold anybody back. And so our society suffers today because we have this superiority complex. And again, within the church, the church is, is being held back today because the youth isn't present in the church because many who are of the younger generations, many who are of my generation, I'm about to be 40 years old in January, we aren't present in the church because many feel like they were pushed away from the church because they felt that their voices wasn't heard. They felt like they couldn't do anything in the church, that they could not give to the church when they had a desire to give to the church. Church became boring to them and so they exited the church. We are suffering today again in the church because of the superiority complex. Should the youth be ignored? Should those who are of a younger generation, should they be ignored? I, I wear this tie today because of my dad. My dad who passed away in, in 2011. Me and my brother, we, we have this same tie we share it with him because that is what we buried him in. And the reason why I bring my dad up in this moment is because my dad was a fan of the youth. He was a fan of, 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 of giving the youth an opportunity, giving them a chance. He, we would have a vacation Bible school uh, at Zion Hill, a church in Atlanta, Georgia, where he presided over it for years. And, and there were so many young people who would come and they would be there and they would receive the gospel. He, he stood over at the Sunday school as a Sunday school superintendent for years and, and Sunday school would be flooded with the youth. And we just don't see that in the church today. And, and I hope that we can get back to that, that in the local church to where the youth will feel the church, to where we will hear the voices of the youth, the younger generations, and to where we will support them, to where we will help them out because they have bright and fresh ideas that will uplift, that, that will be a blessing to us. And so that's something that I hope that, that we take away from the Sunday School lesson today, what we take away from the lesson last week. And, and again, we'll see this in our Sunday School lesson next week as well. The youth, the younger generations, they should not be ignored. They should be heard. They have bright ideas that again, can be a blessing if we simply listen to them. So will you listen to the youth today? They don't always say things that are ignorant. They have helpful ideas, helpful advice that again, we who are of the older generations, we can learn from as well and we can grow from as well. They have advice and words that can lead to a blessing. Will you be blessed today? I certainly again hope that you will listen to the youth, that you will help them, and that you will support them. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson, and I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Be sure that you like this video, and if you aren't doing so already, make sure that you're following this channel. Hit the alert bell as well so that you don't miss any notifications for the next video that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.